Okay. So, hi everyone. My name is Connor, and today I'm going to be talking to you about work that I've been doing with Professor Beer at Indiana University, uh, trying to answer the following question. If we have a biological model, how can we predict which initial conditions will survive or remain viable without actually testing each individual one? Now, the way that we answer this question depends a little bit on the modeling methodology that we're using. For example, if we have a dynamical system where we, the modelers, are saying things like, okay, a toxin cannot get to this amount, food and energy can't drop to a certain point, otherwise our agent is not viable, we're working with imposed viability limits on a dynamical system. But if we are modeling some kind of underlying chemistry or physics that results in emergent structures, these emergent structures have their own conditions for persistence and death, which are unknown to us. Um, and I just want to make this distinction clear because in this first talk, we're going to be talking about the case of imposed viability limits um, in nonlinear ODE models. So to make things a little bit more concrete, we are going to be working with this protocell system where the concentration of two metabolites, M1 and M2, um, are synthesized from fixed concentrations of food molecules in the environment. Uh, M1 and M2 also help synthesize each other's formation. Um, and importantly, this type of analysis I'm going to show you is not limited to two-dimensional systems, but we're going to start in 2D because that's going to allow us to visualize kind of all the necessary moving parts. Uh, the model also has uh, the following viability limits where the concentration of the two metabolites cannot drop beneath 0.1, and the sum of the concentrations can't go above 20. Otherwise, we say that the protocell bursts. This groups all the initial conditions into non-viable and viable starting points, but then we can further decompose the viable starting points based on whether the initial conditions remain asymptotically viable or die in the transient. Um, and this is kind of the goal that we are shooting for. So to get an idea for what the survival space looks like in our protocell, the first thing we do is that we uh, sample a million evenly distributed initial conditions and numerically integrate them for 200 arbitrary time units. And then we look to see the normalized percentage of that time that was survived. Um, and what we end up finding is that there's one non-viable region where the protocell never got started. Then there's an asymptotically viable region where it survived for the entire time. And then there's two transiently viable regions where it's super dim. Um, it did survive for some amount of time, but it did not survive for the full test of duration. Uh, so ultimately, this is what our analysis needs to be able to explain. The first thing we can do is that we can plot the viability limits of the system, and that trivially separates the non-viable region from the initial conditions that had a positive survival score. Um, but then we can do something a little bit less trivial, and we can do a phase portrait analysis. And what we see here is that there are two attracting equilibria points shown in dark blue, and a saddle node shown in green, which separates them with its stable manifold, which is also shown in dark blue. Uh, the one in the lower left is at zero, zero, so it's outside of the viability limits. So all of the initial conditions in its basin of attraction are going to be transiently viable. So that explains one of our regions. But then if we look at that second stable equilibrium point, it's in the viability limits. So that explains why asymptotic viability is possible, but we're missing something because we see that where the basin of attraction intersects with the viability region, we have both transiently viable and asymptotically viable outcomes. And in order to understand how we could have predicted this, uh, we need to think a little bit more carefully about the types of things that can occur when we are actually on a viability limit. So here we have our non-viable region, our viable region, and the limit that separates them. The first outcome that can happen is that the change vector is going to push into the non-viable region, resulting in a fatal outcome. The opposite is that we're going to have a change vector that pulls us back into the viable region, which is recovery. And we can imagine that if we're smoothly transitioning from a fatal outcome to a recovery outcome, there's going to be 
uh, point where the vector field is tangent, which we're going to call mortality point. Now, these mortality points locally separate the outcomes at the viability limit that will immediately die from the ones that will immediately recover. But importantly, it doesn't tell us about what's going to happen past that first moment. Um, in order to do that, we're going to need to find the mortality points that themselves remain asymptotically viable. And if we go back to the protocell system and we plot the vector field along the viability limits, we see that there is one such transition point that remains asymptotically viable. And if we look at its backwards time trajectory, we get this mortality boundary that carves out um, the distinction between that asymptotically viable region and the upper transiently viable one. And the take home point here is that if we had done this analysis at the outset, we would have captured all of the survivability outcomes that we got from sampling those millions of initial conditions at the very beginning. Um, so this is for a single uh, fixed environment, but we can also ask what would happen in different types of environments for the protocell system. And this effectively equates to looking in parameter space. So here, we're looking at the different combinations of the two fixed food concentrations. Um, and for every pixel, we're sampling a protocell, uh, looking at 200 initial conditions for that protocell, numerically integrating for 800 arbitrary time units, and then looking to see what percentage have survived for that amount of time. And we're not going to have time to get into the major details of how this is done, but what I want to get across is that if we think of the appearance and disappearance of asymptotically viable and transiently viable regions as types of bifurcations, and we list the conditions under which those happen, we can get the following curves which separate the parameter space into five regions. Um, and if we go from one to the other, starting with A, we can see that the reason why the A region has no survival outcomes is because the entire viability space is characterized by a single attractor that's outside of the viability limits. No matter where you start in the viability region, you're eventually going to fall outside of it. And then if we go into B, we see a fold bifurcation where we get a new stable equilibrium point, but importantly, it appears within the viability region. So now all of a sudden asymptotic viability is a possibility for a large portion of the initial conditions, which is why we see this brightness suddenly occurring. Um, we then lose that going into C, not because of any changes in the underlying phase portrait, but because that second stable equilibrium point pushes above that diagonal viability limit. So now we have two distinct transiently viable regions. And then if we go um, kind of towards the outer arms of this boomerang structure where we see things getting dimmer, this is where our original protocell's viability space live, where we have this mortality boundary and we have two transiently viable regions that have occurred. And the reason why we see this continuous dimming as we move along is because initially this mortality boundary only covers a very small amount of the space and then it begins sweeping outward and capturing more initial conditions um, as we move along the parameter space in that direction. So this allows us to talk about classes of protocell systems, but then we can also move to a higher dimension and start talking about behavior. So what we have here is we have an environment X where now instead of a fixed food concentration for the protocell, the protocell can move um, and in different directions. And the direction that it moves will be dependent on the relative concentration between the two metabolites. So whichever metabolite is comparatively lower, um, the protocell is going to swim after that food molecule. And same as before, we can look at the upper viability limit, and we can see that there are fatal outcomes shown in red where the change vector points slightly over 
and recovery outcomes uh, that pull back into the viability region. And then now instead of a mortality point where there's this tangency outcome, we actually get mortality contours um, that separate these. And then if we take the segments of those mortality contours that remain asymptotically viable in forward time and look at their reverse time trajectories, what we end up getting is this mortality boundary that begins carving out the transiently viable and asymptotically viable initial conditions. So we can see that both these orange trajectories and the purple ones are within the basin of attraction of that stable equilibrium point. But in the case of the orange trajectories, they end up going over that M1 plus M2 equals 20 plane. Um, and in the case of the purple ones, they respect the viability limits as they converge to that attractor. So ultimately, um, what I'm trying to show here is that if we have a nonlinear model with imposed viability limits, it's possible to do this type of analysis where we can ask which regions of the state space are going to remain asymptotically viable and which are going to remain transiently viable. And it's also possible to begin thinking about bifurcations that occur as we change the parameters such that the possibility is open to classify the the viability outcomes for numerous protocell systems um, as opposed to just the one. And specifically, we can do this not just in one, two dimensions, but we can also start pushing into higher dimensional models that we might be interested in. So um, I also just want to take a moment to thank my lab and all the other people who have been instrumental in helping me think about and do this research and also thank the NSF for being generous enough to help fund uh, this project. Um, and if you have any questions, you can reach out to me here.